Hello and welcome to History 361 Lecture 9, Slavery as a Labor System. This is African American History to 1877 at New Mexico State University. And I am Professor Jamie Bronstein. And today I'm going to be talking about the way in which enslaved people were used in a wide variety of workplace settings and that the work experience depended very much on the task and the industry. What all enslaved workers had in common, however, was being denied the right to the fruit of their labor, to control their own destinies or those of their children. In 1840, the American South was cultivating 60% of the world's cotton, and this cotton represented 50% of the exports of the United States. And working in production of this cotton, there were in 1850, 3.2 million enslaved persons in the US, and 1.8 million of those worked on cotton plantations. The calculation in general was that one enslaved person was needed for every three acres of cotton. During the cotton harvest, adults were expected to pick 150 pounds of cotton a day. They worked sun up to sun down, or in the parlance of the people themselves, from can see to can't see. Workers were organized into labor gangs, overseen by an overseer or driver, who used whipping to keep people working at a back-breaking pace. There were, in cotton production, no monetary or other incentives given for excellent work. There were also quarter hands and half hands who might include young teenagers, elderly people, or pregnant women. As their name suggests, they had a smaller stint of work to do, but they were also fed less than full field hands. Nursing mothers worked in the fields, sometimes being allowed to return to the slave quarter a couple of times a day to breastfeed, or other times propping their babies up on a board in the field or hanging them in a hammock from a tree. Being a field hand had many great disadvantages. It was grueling, back-breaking labor in the hot sun, in the southern humidity. Um, if there was any upside whatsoever, though, it was the opportunity to forge community bonds with other enslaved people, and I will be talking about that in a subsequent lecture. In the background here, you have a picture of a typical cabin of the type that was built for and probably by enslaved people on southern plantations. Rice was produced along the coastline, and then irrigation systems were invented that made it possible to move rice cultivation inland. It was um, cultivated in rice paddies, similar to what was used, uh, the paddies that were used in Asia. Um, the best sort of situation was to cultivate rice near, but not in estuaries, an estuary is a place where salt water and fresh water meet um, so that there was a tide that went up and down, but the tide was fresh rather than salt water. Rice was a labor intensive crop. Uh, it was grown in water and so seeds were planted and then they would be transplanted at various times. Um, the Rice paddy cultivated a lot of weeds too, so enslaved people had to stand ankle deep in the water and pull the weeds and then hand transplant rice plants into deeper water and comb up from below with their fingers any of the plants that had bent over. While enslaved people working in rice fields had some of the same bad experiences as those in cotton, they sometimes had skills in rice cultivation that they had learned in Africa and could broker those skills for better treatment. Other factors that promoted autonomy in the rice fields were a separate slave quarter, the use of the hybrid language of Gullah. Gullah is kind of like a, a mixture of English words, African words, and African grammatical structures, and the use of black rather than white slave drivers. Plantations, rice plantations in the 19th century were 
um, created in the form of a grid, which uh, developed or each um, enslaved worker was responsible for one piece of that grid. In addition to working staple crops, field hands in both cotton and rice constructed and repaired fences and farm buildings, dug drainage ditches, killed hogs and prepared the meat, and cut firewood. Wood. They were fed on a simple diet, a really vitamin deficient diet, in fact, of cornmeal and salt pork, sometimes supplemented with vegetables in season. Sometimes um, enslaved people were given plots of land on which they could grow a few vegetables, but vitamin deficiencies uh, were common. Louisiana was the center of sugar production in the United States, producing one-fifth of the world's supply of sugar in the 19th century. Sugar was an extremely labor-intensive crop. In 1795, there were only 20,000 slaves in Louisiana. That number had been increased to 125,000 by 1850, and it's really because of sugar. In all the sugar counties, black people outnumbered white people. Workers dug rows, planted cane, maintained the growing crops, but the real work happened during the harvest and processing time when sugar was processed 24 hours a day. Enslaved people had to keep cutting wood and feeding it to furnaces, which squeezed, squeezed, squeezed out cane juice from the stalks of cane using rollers that could easily remove an arm if you got your arm in the wrong place at the wrong time. Sugar cane was planted in January and February and harvested from mid-October to December. The planting season was followed by miscellaneous tasks, such as cultivating corn, collecting wood, and maintaining levees and drainage canals. The grinding season started in early November at the latest. Uh, it was called roulaison in French. Sugar production was a dangerous process involving the handling of boiling liquids. Sugar cane juice was heated in a series of open kettles and pans called a Jamaica train. The slaves poured juice from boiler to boiler with long-handled ladles, and so you could get splashed, you could get burned. This old dangerous method of sugar production didn't end until the 1840s when Norbert Rilieu, an African-American born of a French farmer and a free woman of color, invented a sugar processing evaporator composed of mul multiple pans stacked inside a vacuum chamber. This machine, called multiple effect evaporation, was patented in 1843. It improved the refining process, saved time and money, and protected lives. And there you have a picture showing what the sugar cane looked like when it was grown and the way that it was cut with machetes. In addition to cultivating cash crops, enslaved people in North America were carpenters, coopers, wheelwrights, painters, seamstresses, tailors, shoemakers, masons, etc. In urban areas, they were used as porters on the docks and drove wagons to cart goods around. And as I talked about in a previous lecture, often they were hired out by their owners and expected to turn their wages over. We really don't know the names of too many enslaved artisans, but one that we do know the biography of was David Drake, known sometimes as Dave the Potter or Dave the Slave. He was an accomplished ceramicist who lived in Edgefield, South Carolina, and who notably could read and write. He threw some of the largest and really quite beautiful vessels that survived from the antebellum period, and he signed his work sometimes with dedications and sometimes with rhyming couplets like, quote, great and noble jar hold goat, sheep, or bear, and, quote, I made this jar for cash, although it's called lucre trash. Historians have identified a total of 45 large pots signed by Dave. All right, so clearly a man who was not only an accomplished potter, but had a whimsical sense of humor and took great pride in his work, and it is... Um, sad and sort of an uncomfortable feeling that the vast majority of artisans who were enslaved in this time period, uh, we know so little about them. Enslaved people, in addition to being artisans, in addition to uh, cultivating staple crops, 
were also used in industries like salt manufacture. In the Kanawha Valley of Virginia, over 3 million bushels of salt a year were being processed annually by 1846. And the salt industry was chiefly staffed by enslaved people. Why was so much salt in use? Well, it was essential for the preservation of food in a period predating refrigeration. So people salted their food to preserve it a lot of the time. Within the industrial setting, enslaved people made barrels and barrel staves, brought coal to the salt furnace, operated the kettles, operated steam engines, packed and transported salt and cooked for the workforce. A, an establishment with two furnaces needed a workforce of about 60 slaves who could either be hired from their owners or purchased by the company with hiring contracts being for the year being much more common than ownership. In order to entice enslaved people to work, the manufacturers used a daily task system. And task system is when you have a stint or a task of work that you need to finish, a required quota. And then the uh, masters paid cash, quote, overwork. Overwork is a kind of extra bonus for extra work done beyond your task. They kept an account of the amount of overwork that enslaved people had done. And then at the end of the year, they could redeem that uh, credit for goods that they wanted to purchase. Of all the work in the salt industry, coal mining to fire the furnaces was the most dangerous to the point that owners of slaves didn't want to rent out their men to work in the mining part of the operation and often in the rental contracts that they signed would stipulate as much. The furnaces were also dangerous due to boiler explosions and other risks to the enslaved included drowning in the nearby river that was used to ship the salt and contracting cholera. We actually know more about injuries and accidents to enslaved workers than free workers in this industry because if an enslaved worker who was hired out by his owner got injured, that owner could sue the person who was renting the slave. And so these lawsuits were fairly common. An agriculturalist and iron magnate in Virginia named w William Weaver ran Buffalo Forge and Buffalo Forge and iron production uh, forge was run on similar principles to the Kanawha salt industry. Southern uh, iron furnaces were filed by, fired by charcoal. So enslaved people working in the forges had to um, make the charcoal, dig iron ore, and run all aspects of the forge. William Weaver, the owner of Buffalo Forge, owned about 30 adult male slaves, but he also hired about 100 people each year to work in all aspects of production. Over time, the price of hiring in a slave annually increased from $50 a year to over 100. And so to get enough workmen, Weaver not only had to pay more, but he also had to gain a reputation as someone who treated his workforce respectfully. Correspondence from Weaver's Forge shows that masters who owned slaves that they were going to rent to William Weaver couldn't force their enslaved people to go where they didn't want to go. That the enslaved people did have some uh, influence over where they were hired out to for the year. Uh, Weaver, like people who, you know, were working in cotton production or rice production, used the whip for physical punishment, but it couldn't be used too often because Weaver couldn't afford to demoralize his workforce. So in order to, uh, to provide more motivation for people to work, he combined whipping with the overwork system of payment for work beyond the task. And workers were also given an allowance for any supervisory duties that they performed. His account books show his workforce used their accrued pay for things like coffee, tobacco, cloth, sugar, and also to buy out some of their own work time so that they could go back to their home plantations to visit, visit family. He also um, got enslaved people to work harder for him by giving them credit, and then they owed him a bunch of extra overwork that they would have to do. 
<clears throat> so it's interesting that industrial slavery combined this sort of capitalist incentive to enslave people for doing work beyond their agreed upon stint. I think the fact that many of these enslaved people were hired out rather than owned by the company accounts for why that could actually work. The production of turpentine is kind of a weird hybrid. Historians aren't sure whether to classify it as industrial or, in, or agricultural labor. Turpentine, tar, and pitch, all of which are classified together as, quote, naval stores, unquote, come from various parts of uh, or processes regarding pine trees. Turpentine was also one of the two ingredients of campfine, the major fuel used for illumination before the invention of kerosene, and 96% of these naval stores in the U.S. were made in North Carolina. Okay, so how does this actually work? Pine trees have a resin inside that flows when it's warm out. So workers use axes to cut square boxes into trees without killing the trees. The normal rate of cutting boxes into trees was 50 a day. Then in March, workers made additional cuts to the trees that caused resin to flow into the boxes. Then they stuck a tool called a dipper into the box and swabbed out the resin. All together, workers were tasked with between 8,000 and 12,000 trees to be dipped each week, a rate that enabled them to fill between 175 and 300 barrels with raw turpentine over the course of a season. But they also had to chip at the trees about once a week to make sure that the resin kept flowing. At the end of the season, whatever was stuck to the inside of the tree boxes was scraped into pots and distilled using the same kinds of copper stills used to make moonshine. Distilling was the most skilled part of the process of uh, making naval stores and was usually done by free white workers with black assistants. When not actively harvesting, turpentine workers made barrels, tended the pine forests and roads, and did all the infrastructural work needed to perpetuate the industry. They also made tar by burning pine tree parts in a tall kiln. The workforce in turpentine was organized either into the gang system, with a gang of workers being responsible for a particular daily stint of work, or the task system whereby each worker had a quota. In contrast with other workplaces, turpentine workers were usually on the task system and often worked by themselves in lonely tracts of forest where they had nobody to talk to or form families with. They were so spread out that each woods rider or overseer only had 12 slaves to be in charge of and rotated amongst them on horseback. The enslaved people slept in very basic lean-tos or sheds. Their clothing tended to be scanty and their food limited to pork and corn, but because they worked in the forest without you know, being supervised every minute, they could sometimes trap animals to add to their diets, like squirrels and raccoons and things. The final category of enslaved workers I want to talk about are domestic servants. Some tasks within the work life of the plantation were reserved for skilled adults, like being a nursemaid to white children. This was a job that women sometimes had through several generations of white uh, charges or children within a family. Cook was another skilled, um, skilled job within the domestic side of the plantation. Other roles within the main house included dining room servants, Houseboys, gardeners, butlers, carpenters, blacksmiths, mechanics, coachmen, and laundresses. Domestic servants were chosen for features that were particularly appealing to their white employers. Loyalty, intelligence, good manners, Christian religiosity, uh, and, and personal appearance, with light-colored people being favored. This is because in slavery times, both enslaved and white people assumed that mixed race people were superior to black people. Each one of the main adult domestic servants was helped by children and teenagers, some of whom would also be trainees for the main position. Many people who visited the South commented on how overstocked people's domestic staff were, 
but this was in large part because house service house servants were status symbols uh, and also because people who worked as house servants viewed going to work in the fields as a kind of punishment some of the perks of domestic servitude included being able to wear the cast off clothing of the white uh, people who lived in the main house having access to better food um, being sort of considered to be part of the master's family uh, in a way many domestic servants also at least um, to it publicly to other people seem to take pride in the social status of their masters as evidence of their own personal social status um, it's often said that the quote-unquote benefits of being a domestic slave were offset by exclusion from the rest of the slave community but generally speaking domestic servants didn't want to be included with the rest of the enslaved community so I'm not sure that they saw this as a downside um, despite what white people described as bonds of affection between their house enslaved people and themselves when it came to dollars and cents owners of enslaved people did not hesitate to sell family members away from each other if they needed to or to when it was time for states to go through probate to give this member of a family to this person to give that member of an enslaved family to that person that is to separate family members um, because they saw them as property so in the final analysis this rather than all of the eulogizing of our you know beloved uh, black family members this shows the real nature of the relationship between masters and slaves okay that's it for today see you in the comments